Lord, uh, I want to talk about redemption tonight. So our first scripture is going to be found in Titus 2, verse 11 and 4. It'll be up on the board. This is a powerful verse of scripture. Uh, this is coming from the Amplified Bible. So it'll be on the board where we can read it. I got one up there, and we got a board up here, and it'll be up there directly. Hallelujah. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. Willie? You know, the Bible says that we're saved by grace through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. Can you imagine that we were all lost, and all of us were seeking the Lord? No, we weren't. The Lord was seeking us. How many of you know he found us? We were running from God, and he found us and saved us. So you, we owe our birth, the Bible says, and uh, St. John uh, 1, 12, that we owe our birth, or 13, we owe our birth to him. He found us, he saved us. Now listen to this. For the grace of God, his unmerited favor and blessing has come forward, appeared for the deliverance from sin and the eternal salvation for all mankind. So we know that all mankind is included in this salvation that's been provided for us. The grace of God, let's go to the next verse. Notice this, it, now identify it, what is it? What is it? Grace. Grace has trained us to reject and renounce all ungodliness, ill religion, and worldly passion, desires to live discreet, temperate, self-controlled, upright, devout, spiritual, whole lives in this present world. Wow! How do you do that? That's a good one. Well, we do that by the power of the Holy Spirit. We do that by the power of the Holy Spirit. And look at verse 14 now. This is the, the, the verse that I want to launched the message on awaiting well I've got 13 awaiting and looking for the fulfillment the realization of our blessed hope now what is our blessed hope we'll find out in a minute even the glorious appearing of our great god and savior christ jesus Messiah, the anointed one all right go to the next verse 14 who gave himself on behalf on our behalf that he might redeem us, purchase our freedom from all iniquity, and purify for himself a people to be peculiarly his own, people who are eager, enthusiastic about living a life that is good and filled with beneficial deeds. Now just hold that for a moment. Who gave himself on our behalf that he might redeem us. I was thinking today, and I was meditating on this scripture God the Father didn't make Jesus do it if we knew that God made Jesus to die for us what would that do for us if we sort of have a bad attitude towards Jesus but we know that he volunteered that he wanted to do the Father's will he wanted to do this showing his love for us so what he did for us was because he loved us too, even though his father wanted him to do it, and yet he wanted to please the father and honor the father, and he volunteered to do it, and we know that, that he was not made to die for us or to redeem, to redeem us, but he did it. Now, that brings us down to our lives. Why do we do things? Legalistic? Uh, the law says, or do we do things out of love? Paul said, it's the love of God that motivates me to do the will of the Father. What is motivating us tonight? Think about it. What is motivating us to serve the Lord? Well, I'll tell you, I really believe it's the love of God. Because if I didn't love the Lord, I probably wouldn't be here. Because love is so powerful. Love is powerful, strong. Paul says, it's the love of God that motivates me, moves me, compels me to do what I do. So we can say that 
The love of God moved Christ to redeem us. What does redeem mean? The word redeem means to set free by payment of a price. Turn to uh, 1 Peter 1.18. 1 Peter 1.18. All right, now Paul, uh, Peter is saying something you must know. How many of you know there's things that we can know? Now listen to me. There's things that we can know. We may start out by faith believing, but there's a point in which the Holy Spirit makes us know. 1 John 5, 13 says, These things have been written that you might think. No that you might know that you have eternal life. That you might know that you have eternal life. And notice this, you must know, recognize that you were redeemed, ransomed from your useless, fruitless way of living, inherited by tradition from your forefathers, not with corruptible things such as silver and gold, verse 19, but you were purchased with the precious blood of Christ, the Messiah, like that of a sacrificial lamb without blemish and spot. So we were purchased. We were bought with the precious blood of Christ. I thank God tonight I do not belong to myself. I will say that again. I didn't get much amen out there on that one. I am so glad that I do not belong to myself. Because, see, I've been bought with a price. Who bought me? Jesus. And what did he use? His blood. Who bought you? Jesus. So you don't belong to yourself. Boy, not many Christians understand that. Because I'm so glad I don't belong to myself. You know why? I'd be shipwrecked. <laughs> if I did what I wanted to do, but I thank God that he redeemed me, and I know, and I recognize, and I understand. And I'm going to say, we belong to the Lord, and we do not belong to ourselves. And you'll find that out throughout the Scriptures, by the way. So we belong to God. He redeemed us. We were lost. Uh, would you mind bringing the cross up, Mike? We were undone, and yet God, in his mercy and grace, unmerited favor, reached down. I remember in that little Baptist church years ago, back in 1950, um, thank you, I think it was 57, somewhere back in there, when the Holy Spirit got a hold of me, and the preacher wasn't preaching, he was giving announcements, I couldn't sit in that chair. It was the Lord had touched me, and, and I went forward and gave my life to Christ. Just like that. Redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Powerful, powerful. Let's read that again. Everybody look at it now. But you were purchased. You know, when you go to, uh, to the grocery store, how many purchases certain things? All right, when you purchase it, it belongs to you. You pay for it. Don't belong to the store no more. And Christ purchased with the precious blood of Christ, the Messiah, like that of a sacrificial lamb without blemish and spot. You know, none of us like to be put down and rejected. But how many times I have just sat and thought about how they treated Jesus. How many has been in a place that you were really embarrassed? You were really put down. You felt awful. How many has ever been there besides me? I've been there. And that's nothing compared to what Jesus felt. You know, when we read the scriptures, and I want to encourage you to, to be able to enter in and connect with the spirit that's in the word of God. Do you understand that? Now, you need to ask God, uh, that he'll give you that ability that you can touch the Apostle Paul's spirit when he says something. Uh, 
when this word becomes alive to us, you become alive. I think I am more alive today at 82 years old than I've ever been in my life because so much of the Word of God is in me that it just, it just, it's life to my spirit. It's medicine even to my flesh. Proverbs 4.20 says that. Uh, let's turn real quick to Proverbs 20. Uh, I'm sorry, Proverbs 4.20. How powerful the Word of God is that when you know and comprehend it, that it is spirit, and it really, really energizes you. Amen. Okay, that was, uh, let's see, I got it written down right here. Proverbs 420, yeah, 420. Are we up there? My son, attend to my words. Consent and submit to my sayings. Next verse. I know we don't like that word submit. How many likes that word submit? <laughs> Ain't many hands going up. You better learn to submit. Let them not depart from your sight. Keep them in the center of your heart. Why? Next verse. For they are life to those who find them. Everybody don't find them. They read the Bible, but they don't find that life that's in the Word. Jesus said, my Word was life and spirit. You know when you draw, the, you know when you're reading the Word of God and God makes the Word of God a lie to you. My wife Susan and, and, and we have a great time together. I'm reading the Word of God, and she's, of course, she's involved in her world of whatever she's involved in, maybe ironing or whatever. And, and I run in there, and I say, honey, look at there. Man, look at there. She, yeah, I, I see, yeah. And I'm thinking, but ain't it doing something for you? <laughs> what is he? I see it's God's Word. I, it's wonderful. Now, how many of you know the difference? It's been made alive to me by the Holy Spirit, but it has not been alive to her. So the next day, she's in there, and she's reading the Bible. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Honey, look. Yeah, what is it? Look, right there. Yeah, I, I see it. But don't that do something for you? Well, yeah, yeah, I like it. It's the Word of God. Yeah, but, whoa, man, hallelujah. <laughs> see, it's been made alive to her by the Holy Spirit. And how many of you have experienced that? I'm glad I'm going to come out there and pray for you. <laughs> All right. So that's why it's so important for us to get into the Word. And I'm in the Word every day. Let's move to the next now, the next... Uh, Keep and guard your heart with all diligence, and above all that you guard, for out of it flows the springs of life. Next verse. I, give me the amplified. Give me the amplified on verse, just a minute. Let me find it here. 420. Well, one translation which I read, I read it today, that is health, well, it says, who find them health and healing and health to all their flesh. That's in verse 22. Put 22 up there again. For they are life to those who find them, healing and health to all their flesh. And one translation says, medicine to our flesh. That's powerful. That's powerful. Now, remember... Uh, the story that we told about, not the story, but the truth that we told about our two teenage daughters. They were 14 and, and 15 and a half, and they had all the warts on their, or they had, one had 16 warts, and the other one had 19 warts. And uh, we come out with, uh, we uh, come out with a book here on, uh, we made this, put it together, God's Word, Medicine to Our Flesh, and we would have them read that, 
every, twice a day, they would actually read it every day. So a whole month went by, they read it, and they still had warts. And I think they were glad they still were on their hands because they didn't have to do dishes. Susan wouldn't let them do dishes with the warts. So I said, no, well, Dad, I, we've been doing it for a whole month. We've been saying it out loud, these scripture sheets on healing. We're tired of it. I said, honey, it's God's word, it's medicine, it's health, it's life. I want you to continue to do it. So they continued to do it for another month. Now, what I noticed first was their inner man was being built up in the spirit. It was building their inner man. They were getting strong in their spirit man. I was seeing that. Two months went by, still had their warts. Another two weeks went by, and, our, and the congregation saw it at that time. And every wart on their hand was gone. For they are life to those who find them, healing and health to all their flesh. Now, why they had to keep saying it every day, I don't know. All I know is I was instructed by the Holy Spirit to tell them to do that. And so that's why as we get into the Word of God, you will find that your spirit man. Let me say this. A wounded spirit who can bear. The Bible says a wounded spirit who can bear. If your spirit is wounded, you can't bear anything. You've been hurt. How many children have their spirits wounded? They can't bear anything. You say boo to them and they almost fall over. So when I minister to people, I realize a lot of people are wounded in their spirit man. Remember that. And you gotta, if you're going to help them, you've got to get them moving into the Word of God and get the Word of God in there to heal their spirit, to get the life of the Word that's in there. Jesus said, my Word is life and spirit. Life and spirit. Okay? So, we... That's why the Lord says we are accepted in the beloved. Rejection is one of the most harmless emotional wounds that I think anybody can bear. To be rejected by someone that you thought loved you. But a lot of people, imaginations run wild. We're, and many times nobody's rejecting them, but they are imagining that. And it has the same effect upon them. Always remember that. Check your children out and make sure they know you love them and that they're not running around with a rejected spirit. Okay? Now, let's move on with this. Uh, let's turn to 11, 2 Corinthians 5.21. 2 Corinthians 5.21. Now, we've been redeemed. And God has, now I want everybody to listen to this. I'll probably get some uh, uh, amens on this and maybe some shouts. No rocks. Don't throw no rocks. Uh, if you're born again here today, everybody look at me. You are righteous. Not in your own strength, not in your own righteousness. There is no good thing in the flesh. Now, you know I know that. <coughs> but you've been, <coughs> excuse me. We have been made righteous with the righteousness of God. You've got to accept that. <coughs> now, look at what it says. <coughs> For our sake, that's us, he made Christ virtually to be sin who knew no sin, so that in and through him we might become endowed with and viewed as being in an example of the righteousness of God, well, we, what we are to be approved and acceptable in right uh, relationship with him by his goodness. Now turn to, put the King James up there on that. We then, as workers together, no, that's not it, 521, uh, Willie, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. 
for he has made him, that's Christ, to be sin. Now think for a moment. Christ became sin. With whose sins? Our sins. Did you see that? I don't know if some of you see it or not. See, if you don't accept what the Lord has done for you, you're just going to walk around with no victory. For he has made him, that's Christ, does everybody agree to that? To be what? Sin. For who? For us. Who knew no sin. He knew no sin, but he was made to be sin for us. Who knew no sin. That we might be made what? The righteousness of God in him. Now that'll stretch you. Now I'll ask you a question. Are you righteous? Are you righteous? Are you righteous? Are you righteous? Where'd you get that righteousness from? Jesus. His righteousness. Righteous? 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 righteous. See, now when the devil comes at you, you got to tell him what Jesus said. They overcame Satan by what? The blood of the Lamb. It's the blood of the Lamb that has redeemed us. He has, he has made us righteous. All right. Here we were on this side of the cross. We were lost. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We know where that's found. Somebody tell me. Right. Romans 6, 23. <clears throat> on this side, we were lost. We were sinners. But how many of you know when Christ died, who died with Christ? Yeah. Raise your hand if you died with Christ. I say, now you know that. That's important. But how many of you know he made you alive? Hallelujah. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. <clears throat> now there we were on the cross dead now we were dead over here when when adam sinned he died spiritually but he didn't die physically right away but he died spiritually so christ god put us in christ and when christ died being that we were in christ we died <clears throat> and you he made alive when you were dead, slain by your trespasses and sins. So on this side of the cross, <clears throat> before we accepted Christ as our Lord and Savior, our spirit man was born again, recreated by the power of God, born again by the Spirit of God. We were dead. Our spirit man was dead. We had no relationship at all with God. God took us and put us in Christ when Christ died on the cross. That old spirit man died, and when we accepted Christ into our hearts and our lives, we confessed him as our Lord and Savior, and we believed in our heart that God raised him from the dead. God did a supernatural birth in us, born again by the incorruptible word of the seed, uh, of, the seed of God, and then we came out on this side. Our spirit man was alive. To God, and we begin to fellowship with God. But our outer man has not been born again. It is still subject to sickness. It is still subject to a lot of different things. Somebody shut the door on your finger in the car. How many has ever had their finger? In a <laughs> that is, that's a trip. We used to have to watch out for the kids, you know. All of a sudden, wham! How many of you know your body is subject to a lot of things today? But your spirit man has been redeemed. All right, now one day our outer man is going to be glorified. We know that. Okay, but uh, we're not going into that tonight. So, and, and, and you, us, he made it alive when you were dead. In other words, we were dead in our trespasses while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. How much more will he do for us now that we are his children? But see, you have to accept that by faith. Now, I am the righteousness of God. 
Uh, turn, if you will, to 1 Corinthians. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. Now, notice what it says. Get your, word, get your eyes on the Word of God, and, and every word is important. But it is from Him. <clears throat> All right, let's identify Him. A capital H, which either means what? God or, or, or uh, Jesus. So, but it is from God that you, that's us, you and me, that's here, He's talking to us, have your life in Christ Jesus. Why do you have your life in Christ Jesus? Remember all the, all the in Christ in the Bible? Have, how many have seen how many in Christ, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ? Everywhere you see, we're in Christ. Everything we need is in Christ. Everything you need is in Walmart. Is that not true? You, you just go to Walmart. In Walmart, there's everything you need. Parts of the car, paint, whatever, everything. In Christ is everything we need. All right? But it is from God that you have your life in Christ Jesus. See, if you don't take it by faith, it's just words. It won't do anything for you. You've got to believe that. And see what he did. He did it. You have your life in Christ Jesus because of God. God put you in there. Notice that. Whom God made our wisdom. So God made Christ our wisdom. The Lord is my wisdom. I know James talks about praying for wisdom. But to be able to appropriate the word of God, you've got to believe first. So number one, Christ is my what? Wisdom. Everybody say, Christ, Christ is my wisdom. And by faith, everything from beginning to end is by faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Amen. So you've got to believe that, that God put you in Christ and you now have your life in Christ. Whom God made our wisdom from God revealed to us, notice, revealed to us a knowledge of the divine plan of salvation. God has revealed his divine plan of salvation, which we have in Christ Jesus, by his Spirit. Previously, notice this, previously hidden, manifesting itself as our righteousness, thus making us upright. And who's making us upright? God's righteousness upright and putting us in right standing with God and our consecration making us pure and holy and our redemption, notice, and our redemption providing our ransom from eternal penalty for sin. God did it all. Woo, glory. That'll get you shouting. But you've got to accept that by faith. That's our part. And who gives us the faith to believe? God gives what? Every man and woman a measure of faith to believe his word. You know, we've talking about being holy. God says he's made us holy. Now, how do you come into that experimentally? Legally, it's done. But experimentally, you've got to simply say, what you believe. Turn to 2 Corinthians 4, 13. People read the Bible, but they don't know how to appropriate it. You've got to learn to appropriate it. And if God says you're righteous, what should you say? I'm righteous. How many is going to argue with God? A lot of people do, and that's called unbelief. And they wonder why they're not experiencing it in their lives. Are not noticed. Yet you have the same spirit of faith 
as he had. Now stop right there. Look at that on the board. Yet we have the same spirit of faith as he. Now who is he? Remember, it's not a capital H. So it's not God. It's not the Holy Spirit. He had who wrote. Somebody wrote something. All right. And therefore have I spoken. And Paul says, therefore I have spoken because I have the same faith as he who wrote. We too believe and therefore we speak. So you learn to speak what you believe. Now, if you will turn, if you will turn, <clears throat> let me find that. That's in uh, 2 Corinthians. You go, <clears throat> excuse me. You go back in the Old Testament, turn to Psalms 116.10. We'll find out who he is, okay? We'll find out who he is. I always like to find out who he is, who they is, who us is. When you read the Bible, study the Bible, you, that's what you got to do. 16.10, uh, Psalms 116.10. Psalms 116.10, Willie. There we go. All right, now somebody's speaking here. I believe and trusted and relied on and clung to my God, and therefore have I spoken even when I said I am greatly afflicted. Now, now that's a powerful thing when you're afflicted. So I believe, and you'll find out David wrote that psalm. So David says, I believe, and I trust in, and rely on, and clung to my God. And therefore have I spoken, even when I said I am greatly afflicted. He says, I believed and trusted in. So he spoke what he believed, not what you feel. How many feel sleepy right now? Don't speak that. <laughs> See, in the situation when you're afflicted, you got to speak what the Word of God says. Anybody understand what I'm saying? Yeah. See, God's Word is sharper than any two-edged sword. It's life. So you speak. And you read out through the Scriptures, here's what the psalmist says. I am strong in the Lord. Here's what Paul says. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's what I believe. And I may feel real weak. But I speak what I believe, not what I feel. And you've got to get through that. That's faith in operation. I believe I'm a son of God. I believe that I'm righteous. I believe that I've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus. I believe that I overcome Satan by the blood of the Lamb and the word of my testimony. And I love not my life unto death. I believe that you love me. You believe that I love you. We believe in one another. We say what we believe. I believe my children are going to make it, even though it looks dark. I believe. So we speak what we believe. Now, life and death is in the power of what? The tongue. Proverb tells us that. Life and death. We can speak death to ourselves, or we can speak life to ourselves. Okay? So now remember that. Now, turn to Matthew 20, 28. Matthew 20, 28. And we'll get moving on this, try to get moving on this message here. <clears throat> Just as the Son of Man came not to be waited on, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many, the price paid to set them free. Now I'm going to ask you a question. Are you free from sin tonight? Yes. Raise your hands if you are. I'm not saying we don't get tempted. Now that's what it says. Paid to set them free from sin. Free. The price paid to set them free. Paul says, we're free from sin. Sin shall not have dominion over me. 
See, what we believe is important. If I believe in the heart that God has raised him from the dead, well, I don't see, I don't see Jesus being raised from the dead. I confess with, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, well, I don't even see him. And believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, what? Then you're saved. See, what we believe is so important. Wow. That's why we are to read the Word of God and believe the, what the Word of God says. I remember asking this one brother, isn't it wonderful to know that you're righteous in God? I'm not righteous. Ask my wife. I don't, oh my goodness. I believe what God's Word says. I don't have to. I'm not talking about your behavior. Aren't you glad we're not talking about your behavior? <laughs> all, all of us has got some behavior that we need to correct. Is, is that right? Or, or is that down? Per no, no, no. But we're talking about what God has done for us. Yeah, we're to walk in the light as he is in the light. And if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. But if we mess up, Thank God for 1 John. What is that scripture, 1 John? 1-9. One nine. One nine. If you confess, God is faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Now, i got a question. If you confess your sin and he's cleansed you from all unrighteousness, what unrighteousness do you have? I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but is that the way you understand it? That might go against some of our whatever, but that's what the Word of God says. So I'm righteous in God with His righteousness. This is why we have put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. We have put on the Lord Jesus Christ. We are in Him. And we have put Him on, and He's everything That God wants. When, when, when God the Father sees us, who does he see? Jesus. Oh, I tell you, God, this salvation, if, if you, I've combed these scriptures, and it is God that has done it for us. And what do we have to do? Believe it. Accept it then the Holy Spirit has the responsibility to make it become alive to us and we become and we enter into it experimentally. Do we understand that? It's called the fruit of righteousness. First, we receive the seed of righteousness, which is Christ, and then that seed of righteousness in us bears the fruit of righteousness. Okay? How many, we've said this, thoughts produce attitudes. Attitudes produce emotions, and emotions produce a lifestyle. And what do we do? We go after a person's lifestyle and try to change them. No, you can't do it. You've got to go all the way back. And where did that lifestyle, lifestyle come from? Back in their thinking. So as a man thinketh in his heart, so is that man. This is why the Bible says in Romans 12, verse 1 and 2, that our bodies are to be presented to God and we will be transformed by eating pizza. Huh? <laughs> no, we'll be transformed. How? Somebody tell me. I want to know how to be transformed. By the renewing of our mind. We've got to change our mind about some things that we believe in and start believing what the Word of God says where the Word of God will change us. Amen. Let me move real fast, and I can't get to, to all of this. But anyway, uh, turn, to, turn to Philippians chapter 2 real quick. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, you mean I get to give you the verse 13 <laughs> and 14? <laughs> Sorry, Willie. 
All right. Notice this. If you read 12, it talks about work out your salvation here in family. Work it out. Don't work for it, but you work out. But notice what it says in 13, the very next verse. Not in your own strength. That's where people try and fail, try and fail, try and fail, try and fail, try and fail. They're trying to produce what the Word of God is saying them, to them what they are to produce. But you can't produce it in your human effort and flesh. That's why God has given us His Holy Spirit to empower us. Notice this, not in your own strength, for it is God who is all the while effectively at work in you. Now, your faith goes to God, and you say to God, Lord, I thank you that you're giving me the strength to overcome this particular habit, that your grace is sufficient, that you will give me more and more grace. Notice this. It is God who is at work all the while at work in you. Who's working in you right now? God. See, you, you put your faith in God, and where is he? According to that scripture, in us. God working in me. Now your faith is not in your own effort, but it is in God to change you. When I first came to a, 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 a Christian, I drank, I smoked, I cursed, but I was a Christian. I was a carnal Christian. I was jealous, envious, ambitious, trying to promote myself. How many of you have ever been like that? No, I, you don't have to tell me. I know. I've been around too long. What happened to all those desires, all that self stuff? God worked in me and worked it out of me and gave me his desires to just honor him. Just whatever you want me to do, Father, the reward is the same. I'm just willing to do. And, and, and you come into a rest. So many people are not content where they're at, and they're striving here, they're striving there, trying to make God do this, and trying to make God do How many know what I'm talking about? Come on, you've been around long enough. Some of you can identify with that. I know when I first was called to preach, I wanted to save the world, man. Let, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me. And I had to die. Then I didn't want to do it no more. And then God began to empower me. And I had to get out. I had, I, I, I had to go out in the street and, and, and win people to Jesus. I still do that now. It's just in me to do that. It's so relaxing. I can just do it. You know my little Campbell joke, you know. Uh, they haven't heard my Campbell joke there. How do you hide a camel in the desert? See, I got cards. I'll give him a card there. Here. <laughs> say, I come up to somebody uh, at Walmart, and I have a great time. I say, <clears throat> they think I'm going to pull out some money. <laughs> I say, how do you hide a camel in the desert? And they say, I don't know. I say, you camouflage him. <laughs> and when you get a chance, check me out on the Internet. <laughs> well, now, that's witnessing. I have laid before them a hundred and some messages that will change their whole life, and when they die, they'll go to heaven. And on that little card right there. That's amazing. Then I have my tracks, and then many times I ask them this question. They didn't know the answer to the how to hide a camel in the desert, so I'll give them another question. What do you call a camel that doesn't have any humps. You called him Humphrey. <laughs> then I always like to tell him this one. Why was the skeleton afraid to cross the road? I don't know. He didn't have any guts. <laughs> and then I always leave him with this. The, the skeleton went to the drugstore. He ordered a big milkshake and a mop. Then I walk off. And they go, they scratch in their head. I said, did you get it? And a mop? Yeah, you know, it runs all through them and they got to mop it up. <laughs> Listen, I got one more question. If you die right now, where would you go? 
Duh. I don't know. I got some good news for you. Let me tell you what God says. And I'll give him the, I'll preach the gospel to them right there. And many times they will receive Christ right there. I had one person right out here not too long ago, a month ago, that did that. Wherever I go, that's, that's, boy, that should be every man and woman's desire to share the gospel. Because God loves everybody. And he'll do the work. He has done the work for us. And listen, don't try to sanctify yourself. The Bible says he will sanctify. Now, he has sanctified us when we accept Jesus, but he is in the process every day sanctifying us. And I want you to look at this. Not in your own strength, for it is God who is at work sanctifying, you could put, energizing, creating in you, notice, the power and desire. So you can't do nothing without the power and the desire to win people to Christ. I ask you a question. Do you have that desire? Here's what you do. Lord, you said you would strengthen me, you would energize me, you would work in me, and you created me and give me the power and the desire both to will and to work for your good pleasure and, and satisfaction and delight. Now you're no more doing that for yourself. But notice, by his strength, you are now doing his good pleasure and satisfaction and delight. You see the change from the natural to the spiritual. And we all start out on this side. When I first, like I said, when I got saved, yeah, I still drank and cursed and did those earth, but I was a soul winner. Some of you don't believe me, do you? But in a year's time, God went to work in me, energizing and created in me the power and the desire to stop smoking, to stop cursing, stop beating my wife, and stop this and stop that. Come on, church. Love me a little bit. See, that's the power of God. Yes, as far as God's concerned, legally, we are righteous. Legally, we have been redeemed. Legally, if you die right now, you go into heaven. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. I got 10 more minutes. Ah, ha, ha. Oh. Right now, see, if you don't begin to see or even take that scripture and ask God to do that work in you. Lord, you said it was you that was going to do this work in me. I cannot change these desires in me. Now, the desire of drinking... Smoking, cursing, you name it, name it. I mean, give me some of yours. Buying everything you see. Oh, oh I got the women on that one. <laughs> see, all of the, you know what's eating inside of you. See, God is cleaning us on the inside. And then it manifests on the outside. Now, right now, I'm trying to overcome something. Most of you know I got a sense of humor. And uh, I enjoy, you know, my sense of humor personally, but <laughs> does, it, does it please the Lord? Does it honor the Lord? You see, that's where I, I'm at, see? And I realize that, that only God can, can take that desire out. And, and I may do it just to be recognized. You know, there, there's hidden things in us we don't understand. Or I might do it just to be accepted. Someone says, well, keep doing it. We like it. <laughs> How many know what I'm talking about? See, see, in, 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 so... I try and I try and what I fail and fail. Then finally God brings that scripture. Bob, listen. Look at it now. Look at everybody. Not in your own strength, for it is God who is all the while effectively at work in you. See, you might think God's up there at the right hand. He's up there on the throne. He is, but he's down here in his spirit, and he lives within us, and he's working within us. If I was you all, I would mark that in my Bible. 
And I would read it. Now, I'm going to give you one more real quick like. And, and, and I have to let you go. All right, go to Hebrews 13, 20. Hebrews 13, 20. Oh, I love this scripture too. Oh, man. Now, I want you to notice, now may the God of peace, God is a God of peace. I have tremendous, if you don't have that, now there's times that things shake us. How many of you understand that? But the majority of the time, we should be able to live in the peace of God. God is a God of peace. We preach the gospel of peace. The gospel is the gospel of peace. We should have that peace. Now, many times the enemy will stir you. The many times the enemy will come and attack you and throw those fiery darts. And there's warfare going on. But overall, in our lives, we should be relaxed and enjoy the presence of the Lord, Amen. enjoy reading the Word of God, studying the Word of God, loving one another. You're not going to change the world. If you can't change yourself, and you can't change yourself, only God can change you. So your faith is in where? In God. To save you, you're saved. You're redeemed. You die now, you go to heaven. But there's a sanctifying work going on in all of us. You may have, you may have great anger. I had a lot of anger in me when I first got saved. That's why we ex explode Hello, are you out there? Somebody say, have you ever met somebody with a chip on their shoulder? I remember when I was in the Air Force, we always looked for somebody like that. We wanted to knock the chip off <laughs> and watch them explode. But see, as a minister now, I understand that there's some, uh, some unresolved things in their life back here that they have not resolved yet. And you will not get peace in your life until you face it head on, honest before God, and let God go to work on you. Amen. Call a spade a spade and a stud a stud. How many love me now? Uh, one person, but I appreciate it. <laughs> That's true. That's what I had to do in my life. There's people that, that, that have a habit of lying. Nobody here like that. Why do we lie? Hmm? I know why we lie. Because you might beat me if I tell you the truth. It wasn't me that ate the cookies, Mom. It was sister, my sister. And all the cookies are on your mouth. And on, you know, and it wasn't me. I'm innocent. It was Adam. <laughs> that woman you gave me. Huh? That goes all the way back to the garden, don't it? You remember that? The blame syndrome. Are you still blaming everybody but yourself? Well, see, God may want to do the work in you, and you've got to let him do it. Amen. Have you ever heard me holler over there in my uh, house at nighttime when God was operating on me? <laughs> Susan put the pillar over my mouth. They're going to hear it. <laughs> the neighbors are going to hear you. This is real. Is this not real to you guys? I mean, this is real, real life, you know. But boy, when God finishes, because see, his desire is that we will be what? Tell me, what is his desire? That we be what? Created in the image of his son. Are, are we there? You understand that? See, God is working in us. Now, let's finish reading this and we've got to knock off. Got three minutes. For now the God of peace, who is the author and the giver of peace, notice that giver of peace, who brought again from among the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood that sealed and ratified the everlasting agreement, covenant, testimony. Next verse, last verse. Now remember, now may the God of peace, verse 21, strengthen. Now bring that God of peace over strengthen, complete, perfect, and make you what you are to be. Who's going to make you what you are to be? Come on. Give God the glory. God. 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 Say, you've got to start putting your faith in God that he's going to make you what you are to be and equip you with everything good that you may carry out his will, 
while he himself, notice, works in you and accomplishes that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ the Messiah, to whom be the glory forever and ever, to the ages of the ages, amen and amen. And people come to church and sit in church all the time, get up, read the scriptures, go home, and don't put their faith in what God wants to do. Anybody out there? You understand what I'm saying? It's the doer of the word, James says, that will be blessed. So remember that. And who's going to change you from glory to glory? 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. The Holy Spirit. A lot of Christians don't even know they have the Holy Spirit. I really believe we quench the Holy Spirit when we don't let him do that work. How many of you know I love everybody, but I'm a man of truth. I know if we don't deal with truth and let truth deal with us, it's not so much how much we read the Bible, it's how much the Bible can read us. But you've got to begin to let God work in you. Yes. And you've got to set that off by faith. God, I can't do this. Every time my husband says this, I get mad. Well, let God go to work and deal with that inside of you. And every time your husband later on when God does the work, he does that, you'll get glad. You understand what I'm talking about? This is real. This is the real gospel. The real gospel. A living God who lives in his people that wants to change us into the image of his beloved son. Romans chapter 8, verse 29. Let's bow our heads. Be honest with God. You know all of us, and I'm right in the pot with you. Father, there's things in all of our lives that we have tried, many people have tried for years to overcome, not realizing that they're trying to do it in their own strength. I pray right now that the spirit of wisdom and revelation would rest upon each and every one of us right now that we will speak what we believe, that we believe it is you that can change us from the inside out. And Father, right now, we allow him to be preeminent in our lives, first place, to do his work. We're always busy trying to do our work. Let us stop for a while and say, Lord, finish your work. For you said in your word, you have begun a good work in us, and you will continue that work until the coming of the Lord. So, Father, we thank you that we will not hinder the Holy Spirit in our lives to bring us into the image of the Son of God inwardly. And I thank you for that now in Jesus' name. Amen.